Statistics and Excel. Central Limit Theorem, all possible samples, example. Get ready and some coffee because it's time to get realistic with statistics and Excel. Here we are in Excel. First, a word from our sponsor. Yeah, uh, actually we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But, but that's okay, whatever because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like our CPA six pack shirts, a must have for any pool or beach time. Mixing money with muscle, always sure to attract attention. Yeah, even if you're not a CPA, you need this shirt. So you can like pull in that iconic CPA six pack stomach muscle vibe, man. You know, that CPA six pack everyone envisions in their mind when they think CPA. Yeah, you know, as a CPA, I actually and unusually don't have tremendous abs. However, I was blessed with a whole lot of belly hair. Yeah, allowing me to sculpt the hair into a nice CPA six-pack-like shape, which is highly attractive. Yeah, may maybe the shirt will help you generate some belly hair too. And if it does, make sure to let me know. Maybe I'll try wearing it on my head. A and yes, I know six-pack isn't spelled right. But three letters is more efficient than four, so I trimmed it down a bit, okay? It's an improvement. If you would like a commercial-free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. So if you don't have access to this workbook, that's okay because we'll basically build this from a blank worksheet. But if you do have access, there are three tabs down below. We've got the example tab. We've got the practice tab. We've got the blank tab. The example tab, in essence, the answer key. The practice tab, having pre-formatted cells so you could practice the practice problem with less Excel formatting. The blank tab, the one that we're going to be working on, as you can see, is blank. We're going to build this from a blank worksheet, practicing our Excel tools as we construct it. Let's go to the example tab to get an idea of what we will be constructing, looking at an example illustrating the concept of the central limit theorem. The central limit theorem being central to the application of statistics, especially in those applications when we're trying to take a sample of a larger population and see if we can extract meaning from that sample that can be applied to the larger population. We saw in prior presentations that even if the population itself does not have a normal distribution, in other words, doesn't have a bell-shaped curve to the data, possibly it's skewed to the left, skewed to the right, normally distributed. If we take the average of many different samples of the population that are randomly taken, then it's more likely that that set of data will be populated around the mean of the data itself and have more of a normal type of distribution. The normal distribution or bell curve being something that we like because it's nice and symmetrical and we know a lot about it and we only really need to define it with two numbers, meaning the mean, the middle point, and the standard deviation. So in practice, of course, sometimes we know the mean of the population, sometimes we know the standard deviation of the population, but oftentimes we don't know those things. And so we have to be thinking about the sample itself. How likely is the sample to approximate that middle point of the population, the mean, and if we don't know the standard deviation, how can we derive the standard deviation? So we want to further basically convince ourselves we're starting with a population this time. So it's useful to start with a population that is known and then take samples from it. This time we're going to take all possible samples to prove to ourselves that if we took all samples of it, meaning all types of combinations, then we're going to get a mean that will be exactly equal to the mean of the population, which gives us evidence that if we took multiple samples, it's likely that we're gonna zero down more the average of the samples, the average of the averages, right, will be more likely to be the middle point of the actual population. We can also uh, see that the standard deviation will change in a fairly predictable way, which we're not going to go into a lot of detail, but we want to know conceptually because that's how we're going to get to some of these uh, formulas. 
which sometimes we have a formula for it here and sometimes Excel will give us a function for it, which will help us to approximate the standard deviation in cases where we don't know the standard deviation and we're trying to extract meaning from say a sample when we don't know the standard deviation of the population. All right, keeping those things in mind, we're gonna take our population data, we're gonna put all possible combinations together from it, and then we're gonna check the standard deviation and uh, the, the uh, mean, and then we'll also uh, make our frequency distribution tables here. All right, if the second tab, the practice tab has pre-formatted cells, so once again, you can kind of work through the problem with less Excel formatting, but we're gonna build the whole thing from scratch over here on this tab so here we go we're going to just build our data set so we're, so we're going to say sales we're going to imagine their sales reps let's go ahead and select the whole thing first i'm getting ahead of myself and then i hit the triangle right click let's format our data let's make it i like to make it currency to start off with negative numbers bracketed no dollar signs and no decimals to start off with all right okay that's our starting point then I'm going to make it bold. You don't have to make it bold. Home tab, font group, bold. But I think it's easier to see on a screencast. Therefore, I make it bold. You have to be bold when you're presenting stuff. Or else, or else, the, 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 or else it doesn't work. All right. So then we're going to say there's going to be our sales rep. And then we'll say our sales number. That's just going to be our example data. I'm just going to make the sales rep. I'm just going to give them the generic names of A, B, down to G. So this is like the musical alphabet of sales rep. Uh, <laughs> oh, it, it couldn't recognize that pattern. All right, C, D, E, F, G. There. Then we're going to say the, the sales amounts. I'm just going to make up some numbers. 195, let's say 260, uh, 220, 320, 308, 412, and 380. Let's make this black and white for our header. We're gonna go to the home tab, font group. We're gonna make this black and white as we typically do for our headers. Let's center it. Then I'm gonna take this information. I'm gonna make it blue and bordered like I typically do for the data input info. Home tab, font group, dropping it down, making this all borders, dropping down the bucket. If you don't have that blue, I go into more colors standard and then i pick up that blue right there and boom that's it look can i make it a little bit smaller maybe this one can be like a little smaller okay all right and so then let's put some standard information about this is our population now the population is quite small here because what we want to do is look at all possible examples or samples all possible combinations and there's going to be a lot of combinations that you can have even with a few numbers so let's analyze this. We have the pop size, that stands for population. What's the size of the entire population? It's a small population, only seven. I can then say this is gonna be equal to count. If I count the numbers, I pick these up, right? It's the count function. And then there's the, our, now if it was letters, just to let you know, you can use the count equals count a i think a stands for alphabet is probably what they were thinking so if i counted these cells i get to seven again just to let you know that if you run into a situation where you've got letters and not numbers then you have to use the count a function all right what's the mean of the pop of pop the pop mean all right so i'm going to say okay let's go ahead and say this is going to the mean is the average taking them all and then divided by seven summing and divided by seven average we'll just use the function though boom shift down to not pick up the title there we go it's going to be 299 let's add some decimals i want to add a lot of decimals to make it exact i'm going to make this a little bit larger here because i want to compare that to what we get when we make all different combinations all right, so that's going to be the mean. And then what's the standard deviation? STD of the pop population P. That's going to be our function here. This is going to be STD of the population is going to be, boom, all of this. And so those are the two things that we need to know if it was a bell-shaped uh, curve. Notice that this data itself may or may not be in a bell 
a, a bell-shaped uh, type of situation. If I was to make like a histogram of this, it's not much data to make a histogram from, but insert charts, we can histogram it, and then possibly adjust our buckets down here and say bucket bends, uh, bend width, let's make it like, let's make it like 50. And so, right, it's not really normally distributed, 25, let's say. So it looks something like that, right? It's not, not exactly a normal, more like a, maybe a uniform distribution, right? It doesn't have like that bell shape, although there's not really enough data to really get into that. Let's pull this down here somewhere. Let's put it down here. All right. So I'll just put that down here just as a reference. Okay. And so what did we leave off? The standard, uh, uh, so possible samples. How many possible samples could we have? Now I'm gonna take a sample of three, only three out of the sample of seven, because that's gonna be our, our samples that we're gonna be taking. So we, we could say, all right, so how many possible samples of three, of three could we have? Now, note, we have to be careful when you count these up because you might say, well, what do you mean that if I have A, B, and C, is that the same as B, A, and C? Right, and we're gonna say that's the same sample, right? If I if I if I pick the same three numbers, I don't care which is first in this case. I'm not gonna count that as another sample because it's the same three numbers. So so I'm gonna use a formula to do this. We're gonna say this is the combine formula equals combine, and the combine is gonna be the number. Uh, which is going to be the seven. That's going to be this one. And then the number chosen, I'm going to say is three. And that should give us 35. So we have 35 different uh, combinations that we're going to have to put together here. Okay, so then I'm going to make this, I'm going to make this whole thing border blue. Let's make this border blue. And we'll stop it there for now. I'm going to, I'm going to compare that later though to the, let's put it down here, I'll put it here for now, the mean of all uh, the means, or you can call it the expected value possibly. And I'm gonna indent that, boom, we'll calculate that. And then we're gonna be calculating the STD uh, of the population of all possible samples meaning we'll look at all possible samples. That's why we're still using the standard deviation of the population because it's, it's gonna be all samples. So we'll take a look at that shortly. I'm gonna also make that blue and bordered. And then we're gonna have a formula for the standard deviation. So we'll calculate the standard deviation and then we'll also use this formula for it. I'm gonna make this uh, black and white. So I just typed in standard deviation x bar uh, without uh, every possible x bar so in other words we're going to use this information to look at the standard deviation to and then get an idea of what is happening with it and that's how they're basically deriving this formula which will be used in the future in order to help us to figure out the standard uh, deviation in situations that we might need it where it's not where we don't know possibly the standard deviation of the population. So we'll get an intuitive sense of it here. And then of course, in the future, we'll just start to using the formulas, but we want to get some idea about, you know, how, where do these formulas kind of come from, right? They're, we, we're, we're looking at these relationships to get an idea of that. All right, let's go ahead and make this a little bit smaller here and let's put together all combinations. So all, all, combinations and so we've got to do, 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 do and then i'm going to say sales uh one sales two and these are sales three so let's make this to do so i'm going to say let's pull this one out a bit i'm going to pull this over here so i'm going to put just the letters first and then i'll pull in the related numbers connected to those letters. Now, this is where it gets a little bit uh, tedious to kind of think about, okay, how can I get all combinations here? Well, okay, I could say, let's, let's start and say, I could say, let's start with the A's 
And there might be a formula to do this better, but I'm just going to do it this way so you can kind of see how you might go through the thought process, right? We pick up all the A's and then I could have uh, all the B's. Uh, so an A and a B. So I'm going to say A and B, B, and this will equal the one above it. And boom, do, 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 do. we'll copy that down. And then we're going to have all different combinations. So this is an A, B. So we've got A, B. And then the next one is going to be C. So now I'm just going to copy from C and then D, E, F, G. Right? And then I could say, okay, then the next bit is going to be, we're going to keep on starting with the A's. But this time, we're going to go from to C. So the next one uh, is going to be A, C. C, 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 and then I'll start from C down. So then it starts at the D. So then I have D, E, F, G. And then, so, so then we got all A's again. So now we'll say all A's. And we went to, now we're going to start at the D. So D, 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 and the combination is D, E, F, G. And then we've got, okay, then, uh, then next, we've got all A's with an E. So we'll say, okay, A's with an, with an E, E, and then it's going to be E, F, G. And then we've got all A's with just uh, the G. I'm sorry, it's with the E. Uh, with the F and then the G. So then the F and then the G, right? <laughs> and then I could go to the B's. So now I've got all the B's. So I'll say B's, duh, 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 duh. and these are the B's here. And the next one after that is a C. So we've got the B's are going to be C, 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 C. And then we start, we have the, the, B, C, D, E, F, G. And then again, we've got all Bs again. We're going to say paste one less. Right now we have three of them. And we're going to have the Ds. D, D, D. And then the one after the D is an E, F, G. And then we've got all the two Bs now. Two Bs that we're going to have. And to do, I'm going to say to do it. And then we have the E, and then F, G, and then of course we're at the 1B, 1B left, and that's going to be at the F, and then the G. And then we go to the C's. So now we're going to say we're at the C's. And then we have the D is next to the C, and then after the D is the E. F, G, and then of course we only have two C's. So two C's, and then we have E's, and then F, and then G, and then of course we have one C, D, and then F and G. Almost there. Oh, what did I do? I got excited because we're getting close. And then, okay, and so then. We're going to go to the D's. So we have the D's. And we'll paste that here. And I'm going to say this is going to be E, E, and then F, G. And then we have a, another D, F, G, and finally E, which only has an F and a G. Okay. Did I ca Let's count this. Count. And I'm going to say count A because I want to count the letters now. So I'm going to count and see if it comes out to 35. That gives me some confidence that I got all the combinations right. That's why we have a small amount of population because we're doing all possible combos and that was really tedious to do. But it's kind of useful, I think. So there it is. So now I'm going to go and make this a little smaller. Let's make these a little thinner. If we could, they're a little, they're a little heavy. They've, you know, they've kind of slacked off a bit. I don't blame them. Okay. But 
you have to thin up here. Home tab, font group, let's make that black and white. Let's make these centered, home tab, uh, alignment and center. Okay, so now I just wanna pull in the, the numbers compared. So, this, so I wanna pick up this data and then pull in the related sales number. So I could do that with an X lookup. Now there's a couple ways you can kind of do this X lookup. I could say, give me an X lookup. And I want to say uh, the values that I want to pick up, you could do, uh, well, that's not an X lookup, X lookup. All right, so I could look up, this is the lookup values. I could do this kind of like one at a time, meaning I want you to find uh, this number and then comma, look it up in the lookup array, which are these numbers. And then I want you to comma return, give back to me the related numbers in this column. So find that A over here, there it is. And then return to me that 195, boom. And then if I copy that over, I'd have to say, okay, there's the lookup value. It's gonna change as I copy it so I can leave that as is. The, the lookup array is gonna be the same. So I'm gonna say F4, F4, and then the return array, array is gonna be the same. So I'm gonna say F4, F4, enter. And then I should be able to copy this this way. So it still looks at this up. It gives me this C, right? And it, and it returns uh, 220. And then I should be able to copy this and copy it down and see if it does actually uh, yeah, it's doing the right thing. So here's the B. There's the B 260. And there's the 260. Now you can also use this in, a, in an array function, which could be a little bit easier, but sometimes it's confusing as well, you know, but we have to practice these array functions as well. So we can also say this could be X lookup, this would be a little faster to do it. And now we're going to say the lookup array uh, that we want is going to be from here to here. And then and then that's going to be the lookup value. Actually, no, the lookup value is going to be this whole thing. Lookup value, not including that count. And then comma. And then the lookup array is going to be look that up, look all of those values up here. And then uh, the comma, the return array, give me these numbers. So now this should do the whole thing, right? And paste the whole thing out at one time without having to use absolute references and so on, enter, and it does a spill array formula. I still kind of like using <laughs> the absolute references because I, I think, I just feel like it's nice to have a reference in each of the cells, but maybe that's not, it's kind of, what, anyway, either way you want to do it. All right, so then we're going to say this is going to be the mean or average. And so now I'm going to say this is going to be the average of these three Whoop. equals the average tab of these three enter. So this would be like our all of our samples, except that we took every possible sample. So we took samples of three and we took every possible sample. So they're not exactly random samples, but you can imagine it being similar to us taking every possible sample of three of a population that only has seven in it. Now we're taking the mean of each of those samples. How many samples do, do we have? We have 35 samples because there were 35 different combinations of a sample size, also called N oftentimes of three. Let's double click that average down and there we have it. So now I'm gonna make this format, paint that over here. And then there is our total thus far. Now, each of these samples has the same probability of coming up. So, so the prob of, of the sample, let's just say probability of S, each of these ones could have an even chance of coming up, which is gonna be equal to one over, how many numbers do we have? 35, enter, oh, hold on a sec, let me do it, equals, one over the 35 and then make that a percent percentified do, do. so each of these samples have the same likelihood let's f4 the second one and then copy it down 
the same likelihood of coming up because of from a, from a random selection. If you put these into a pot, into a hat, and you just picked up A, B, C to G, and it was totally random, the, and you picked out three of them, then you would expect the, to have an, an even chance for any of these samples to be coming up. So let's go ahead and select all of this, control shift down. I'm gonna make that uh, bordered and blue. All right, so now we can complete this. Now we're gonna be looking at this one and say, what are the mean of all of the, uh, all of the means? The mean of the means equals the mean, let's say average of all of, all of the averages of the samples of three that we took. So we're gonna say that's gonna be equal to this and it's coming out exactly to this number. So these two are the same. So that gives us some confidence that the more samples we took, this were not not random, we took every sample, but it gives us some confidence that if we took random samples and we had a whole bunch of them, then you would expect that it would go towards the mean of the actual population of seven. That's given us some confidence about that. Okay, and so, the, and so then the next thing we wanna say, okay, well, what about the, the STD equals the standard deviation? Now, normally we use the standard deviation of S for the samples, but in this case, we used every possible sample. So although these are all samples of three, we're using the P because, because it's for the population, because they're all possible samples. So if I take that and we say, okay, the the STD is not the same as this STD, but we know some some correlations on how the how the uh, the the standard deviation acts, which allows us to create a formula such as this to give us to give us the information for uh, the standard deviation. So that's going to be so. So we just want to note that out because those are the two things we need when we're trying to take sample data and get a population information and create a normal distribution, the mean and the standard deviation. Sometimes that's known uh, of the population and sometimes it isn't given our whatever we're doing. Let's make a skinny over here. So now we will we're, we're going to say, how can we create like a randomly generated sample. So these, we took all possible samples. Let's think about how we can make a random generation of the sample data. This is one way that you can do it. You could take, you could use our rand function and we could say this is gonna be equal the rand of the, um, uh, let's just say normal rand and we'll just, that's it, just close it up, boom. That's gonna give us a very long random number and then we can say that if we're taking basically uh, three of these, do, 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 I'm just going to take a random of three, then, no, actually, I'm going to take all seven numbers. How many are there? Seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven numbers. That's our entire population. And this is our entire population, which is going to be A, B, C, and so on. So I'm going to go boom. And we'll say this is going to be equals that going down. So there's that. Uh, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And this last one, I had too many. And then the actual numbers is going to be equal to these. Enter. Copy that down. So this is going to be the RAND. This is going to be then the sales rep let's just copy this over here sales rep and then the sales number all right now you could make this into a table and then it'll shuffle so you can see that this random number generation is shuffling but it's not shuffling these numbers as it shuffles so you could then uh you, you could make it into a table which it will make it, it'll shuffle i'm going to make this home tab font group make this uh, black and white and then center it, center it. And then I'm going to make this blue and border. We'll make this border blue. 
No, I'm actually gonna hard code the information in these cells so you can see I pulled this in with a formula, but I want it to be able to shuffle when I shuffle this data. So I need to make it hard coded. So I'm gonna copy all this, control C, and then I'm gonna paste it one, two, three, just the values. So now you can see it's just uh, just the number or the letter, not a formula. It's not shuffling, however, with this one. To make it shuffle together, then we can either enter a table, inserting a table, or we can possibly just go to the data and then add the filter. So we can add a filter to it. Now we have our filters up top. And when I shuffle this one, I wanna make it go from like A to Z. Then you can see it's actually shuffling the actual data over here. You can see that when I shuffle it, it doesn't actually uh, put it in order. It's not in order anymore. What happened? That's because every time it, it regenerates, then it messes up the, the random. So it's trying to shuffle this order, but then when I hit the shuffle, it shuffles it again, right? So I hit the shuffle and then after it reordered it, it shuffled it again. But it then, it did make a random generation over here. So I could pick the random first three numbers are basically basically random generated uh, numbers or you can shuffle it multiple times and just keep on picking the top number three times if you wanted to do it that way. Another method uh, that we might use is we can say that we want a sample of three that are gonna be uh, randomly generated. So I'm gonna use an index function. So it's gonna be equals index tab the array that we want to be picking up from is going to be this array and then comma and i want to pick up random numbers or random cells within this array therefore i'm going to put in random but it needs to be random between so it's not between two different numbers it's between rows here the rows number one starts not up here but at this one this is row one to row seven because there are seven numbers in the sample so give me a random number index between one comma and seven and close it up and then boom. And so there it gives us an A, right? So then if I wanna copy this down to three random samples, I could say there's our A, let's make this F4. So the F4, so that the array is the same, enter, copy it down. So there is our three numbers that are three letters. I then just wanna pick up the the sales related to those letters, which we can use the X lookup to do, equals X lookup tab. And the lookup value, we wanna, again, uh, pick up the this number and then comma, I'm gonna copy it down instead of using the spill array this time, and then comma, and then this is going to be the, I'm gonna pull this over a bit, the lookup uh, array, look it up over here, find that A over here, in other words, comma, and the return, what do we wanna be getting? We want you to give me this number. So look up that D here, give me the 320, enter. I wanna copy that down, so if I double click on that, then I want this value to move that down. I don't want this to move, so I'm gonna say F4, absolute, F4, absolute here, F4, absolute, F4, absolute so that I can say the arrays don't move, copying that down, and it gives me a random three, which doesn't shuffle. Uh, well, actually it does keep shuffling. <laughs> All right, yeah, because I still have the random function. So that's two ways that basically you can get the random function. Let's make this black and white, duh, 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 black, white, and then let's make these uh, bordered and uh, blue. And then I'm gonna copy this one more time and paste it here and then paste it one, two, three. That's the values. So we're just gonna freeze it here. So this one's not gonna shuffle anymore. So this will be the one that we'll basically work with at this time. So notice that that combination has to be over here somewhere, right? Because we did all combinations. So we should be able to find this three numbers over here in our combo, but I won't get into that in detail. Now let's make this a little bit skinnier. And then I'm gonna make this skinny L, let's make that also over here. And I'll make that skinny one the same skinny as this skinny. Okay, so now we can say, given that information, we can, we can let's pull this one, let's pull this sample, I'm gonna say cut and put it up top so we can work with it 
on this side. So that's the, that's our end of the sample that we're going to be working with. It doesn't move. <laughs> All right. So then we're going to say the N equals the sample size. Size. So how big is our sample? Three. So I can do that with a count equals count tab. I'm going to count the numbers, therefore not count A, but just count. There's three of them. All right. Is N over N less than 5%? 5%. Why do I ask that? Because whether or not when we use this formula, which we're going to use right now, uh, whether we have to use the second bit will be dependent upon uh, the, the, the size of the population compared to the sample. Now, oftentimes in practice, you don't have to use this bit because it's going to be greater than the 5%. Now, these sound like kind of arbitrary rules, but the idea here is that they can see this relationship when we start to think about the standard deviation, given the fact that it changes in a predictable fashion, which is what we're trying to prove here, so that we can be more comfortable kind of using these formulas, having an intuitive idea of what exactly they're doing. So basically, the, the idea here is we're going to take this is going to be equal to the n, which is going to be 3, divided by the population n, which was 7. And because that's going to be, to, 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 it's not less than 5%, it's pretty large. That means we have to, we have to, to do an approximation, use that formula, that second bit of the formula. Okay, so then we're going to say if we have... Remember the two things that we need in order to create our bell shape or normal distribution are number one, the middle point, otherwise known as the mean or the average, and number two, the spread, otherwise known as the standard deviation. We now want to be able to approximate what the proper standard deviation should be given just the one sample, these three numbers, which we think if properly done should be close to the standard deviation that we took over here for all possible samples of three calculated uh, with our formula here. Standard deviation of the population using the P instead of the samples, given the fact that these are all possible combinations. And we got to the 34.93 versus the standard devi deviation of just the population, which is the 7409. So given just one sample of these three numbers, we're going to be using this formula to help us to calculate that. This formula has the correction factor, which we just talked about that we're going to be using in this case, given the relationship between the sample size and the population. It also assumes that we know the standard deviation of the population. This whole thing, the population, this is the standard deviation of the population. Sometimes we know that and sometimes we do not know that. When we don't know that, we're going to alter the formula a little bit to give us a better approximation uh, given that information. So let's go back on over. So this is basically going to be the standard deviation STD of the sample estimated by the formula. Formula, we'll talk more about this in future presentations, but that's going to be the uh, general idea of it. If we know, if we have the STD of the population, that's when we use this particular formula. Okay, so then I'm just going to try to type in the actual calculation of the formula in here. So it's going to be, did you, let's make this a little bit wider. It's going to be equal to the, and let's put this formula down here so you can see it. So we're going to say the formula, let's copy this formula and go boom and say put it over here boom and then i'm going to say okay so then this is going to be equal to so we need the square root uh I, i'm sorry the standard uh the standard deviation over the square root of n which is the sample so this is going to be then the standard deviation of the population which is here not this one that's for the this one up here of the entire population we're going to take that and divide by now when we divide uh we're gonna have the square root that's done with this function in excel sqrt square root of n uh n represents the size of the sample 
we said that is going to be three. So that's going to be the three. I'm going to close up uh, those brackets. We're going to take that entire thing and multiply it times. And then we're going to take the square root of, let's say, SQRT of this whole thing. So we're going to say brackets. And then I'm going to put the numerator. I have to put more brackets. We're going to take the size of the actual population, which is seven. There were seven numbers in the population. This is the correction factor, by the way, that we don't always have to use, but we have to use it here, given the relationship between little n and big n sample compared to the size of the population. So this minus then uh, the, the n, and the n is going to be this. And then we're going to close that up. And then I'm going to divide it by, once again, brackets, the size of the population, which is seven, and then just simply minus one, closing that up. Hopefully I got that correct and enter. It wants to do something to it. There, there it has it. Okay, so does that look right? Let's take a look at it. If I say that's going to be to do, let's add some decimals. Do, 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 do. And so that comes out to uh, 34.928. So let's compare that and look at the difference. The difference. So this equals this minus what we calculated over here, which is basically the actual number. And the difference is pretty small. So you can see that this formula, just with this sample of three, basically estimated the proper standard deviation of the population means which we calculated by mapping out every single one of them. So that gives us some hopefully some intuitive confidence that this these formulas and what these formulas are doing. If I know the the the, the population uh, standard deviation, I can I can approximate the standard deviation, even with the small sample of three uh, using using this formula, in this case, using the correction factor, which sometimes you don't need. All right, so if the sample size versus the population was different, let's go ahead and put some brackets around that and say, okay, that's interesting. Duh, duh. Now let's take a look at the mean, the mean of the sample, and that's just the average, average. So if I took just these three numbers, that's not much to go on, but in this case, how close is it to the actual mean? The pop mean, the pop mean is equal to what we calculated over here. The uh, mean of all the means. No, this is the pop mean. Boom. And so there they are adding some decimals. So what's the difference? Difference equals this minus this. So it's it's not perfect, right? But it's gonna it's fairly close here, even just with a sample of three. So then our sample gives us that information. Obviously, we're gonna assume that middle point of the sample, if that's all we have, would basically be the middle point of the population. And we'll talk about confidence about that later and so on. And then we can kind of estimate that standard deviation given in this case that we know the standard deviation of the population uh, in later times, we'll adjust that formula when we don't know it. All right, let's go ahead and, and graph these things. So let's go ahead and make this one uh, format paint this over here. Let's put these into our buckets. Now I'm going to show you how to do these buckets uh, a couple different ways, uh, just so you can get an idea of them. So I'm going to say this is going to be the lower and, and upper. These will be our ranges. And we'll make our graph of this. Let's make this black, white, and center and let's say we're just going to say the 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 lower uh we'll just go 75 let's say it's going to be i'm just going to say it's 175 and it's going to go up by 25 so it's going to be this plus 25 and then we'll take it down to say 400 should be enough so we'll take it to let's say 400 and then the upper is just going to be equals this plus 25. So there are our ranges. I'm going to copy this down. Now notice I have 200 here, 200 here.
So this is really going to mean that it's going from 175 up to and including 200. This is going to be starting just above 200 up to and including 225 and so on and so forth. You can also construct it the other way so it does not include the 200 and then you include the 200 here for example but the idea is that if it lands on 200 exactly then of course you don't want to be double counting that now i'm going to make a category name which you don't really need but if you want to make a really fancy table that's a little bit more clear you might do this so that you can add it to your table so I would like to say, I would like this to go up to this. So I have it in text words, so I can add that to the X of my histogram type table. So I'm gonna say this is gonna be equal to, this is the lower bit, and then I wanna put text. When I put text, I have to use quotes, and to put quotes, I have to tie it together with an and. So and just means tie that together to this text bit, which is gonna be in the quotes, including a space, and then I'm gonna say up to space, and then space after that, and then end quote. And then I'm gonna say up to this number. Oop, hold on a sec, I have to put an and, and then this number. All right, and then enter, and then it gives me this little text. So I can use that. You don't necessarily need that because you could just put the upper limits and, and then explain that to people, but this will be a bit, little bit more clarifying if you wanna make a more fancy graph. I'm gonna copy that down. And then I'm gonna calculate the buckets two different ways. One with a frequency distribution, a spill array, and another one using the count uh, if function, given hopefully the same answer. Let's take this whole thing. I'm gonna make this uh, black, white, and centered. Use first our, our spill array. This is gonna be equal to the frequency. So what I wanna do is graph out uh, this information, the means here. So I'm going to be picking these means, putting them into the buckets. So I'm going to say control shift down. That's going to be where the data is coming from, the data and then comma. I want to put them into the bins. I have two columns. I just do the outer column, the end of it, and it will properly put in the buckets. So I'm going to say, okay, spills it down. There we have it. So now I'm going to do the same thing with like a count if function so we can get the idea of it it's actually ifs with an s count ifs because there's two conditions so i'm going to say this equals count if let's have an s tab the criteria range i'm going to go over here and i'm going to pick up this whole thing and make it a spill array so these are all of uh the means and i'm going to say control backspace it takes me back on over criteria I want this to be greater than, so I'm gonna put that in quotes because it's a text, quote, end quote, and then I have to put an and after the text, and I want it to be greater than this number, not equal to, but just greater than, and then I'm gonna say uh, comma, what's the second criteria? I have to add the range again. Now I could do this by just copying, it's the same range. Copy that range and put it here. So then we're gonna have uh, the same, hold on a second. Did that copy the same range? I wanna copy this do, 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 and paste it here for the criteria. And then the criteria uh, for the second, it's gotta be in quotes less than, and this time I'm gonna add the equals in the quote because that's a text and then tie it out to this number it's got to be less than or equal to that number and then i will close it up and enter so hopefully if i got that right i'm then going to go back in is there anything i have to make absolute to copy it down i'm going to make this absolute because i don't want that range to change f4 at four this absolute f4 f4 i do want these to move down as we move them down so i'll leave them as is and then copy this down and so we get the same kind of result. This is gonna be over that amount, and this is gonna be the total, uh, or the total, if I sum this up, uh, let's get rid of this. This equals the sum of these, doo -doo, and I come out to 35, uh, which makes sense, because that's the amount of numbers that we had over here, 35 over here, so that looks good. All right, let's make this a little smaller. I'll make this a little smaller and I'll make this blue and bordered. Duh, duh, duh. 
and then we could then make basically a histogram uh, from this information. So I could say, all right, let me pick up this and say, let's go and insert. And then I'm going to go charts and hit the drop down and I'm going to make a bar chart from it. So there's going to be our bar chart. Tut, 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 tut. And then I want to make the X's uh, line up to, to this category. That's why we made this fancy category. So I'm going to go in the chart design data and then I'll select these items and I want to change the range to these. Did I get that right? Let me do that again. These to these. And then I usually click on this just to make sure that that's populating properly. And so there we ha have it. And you can see we have more of a bell shaped uh, type of curve with our, with our histogram uh, here. Now we could also try to make like our our actual bell curve based on on this by saying I want the X and then the P of X brackets. Let's make this home tab font group black, white, and uh, center that. And so we're going to say this is going to be let's just make it going from like the min to the max. So let's go over here and say all right. The, let's say that the the min of our data equals the well let's do it let's do it this way we're going to say our table is going to be the lower part of the x is going to be equal to the middle point the mean over here which we said is going to be we'll pick up the mean of the sample and then i'm going to add four standard deviations away from it so this is the lower i'm going to subtract four minus standard deviations uh standard deviation in here and then i'm going to say uh, times four that's the lower and the upper upper x is going to be equal to the mean we're going to say that's going to be the middle point again so the mean of uh, the sample plus the standard deviation of the sample times Four. So let's go from 149 to 429. So I'm going to say uh, 149. Let's do it this way equals the sequence of, uh, let's say, 149 minus one, uh, 429 minus 149 plus one. And then we're going to say, comma, uh, with uh, within within a uh, text hold on I, this is a search i want a sequence that's not a search this needs to be sequence tab so there we have it there's the rows this will be plus one columns one comma starting point is going to be this number and then the steps in just one one at a time so that you can also do it by saying 149, 150, and then copy it down until you get to this this bottom number, right? 1428. That was our that was our last number, 429. Close enough. So then we're gonna say this equals norm.dist. We'll do this multiple times in the future. I'm doing this fast because we've we're running long here. So we got the x comma the mean. I'm going to pick up the sample mean over here. So now we have the mean of the sample. I'm going to say F4, making that absolute comma standard deviation. So the standard deviation is going to be this one uh, that we calculated with our formula. And I'll say uh, F4 on that one and then comma zero because it's not cumulative and then enter, make that a percent cop add some decimals, copy it down, boom. The total is adding up to about 100%. So if I go down, it's like, okay, 100%. Let's go back on up. And then we can make our graph from that. Control shift down, control backspace, insert. Let's make a chart, boom. Let's make it an area. 
this time. And so now we have our, our, our actual approximated bell-shaped curve, which is now using, because now we can approximate the bell shape, right? And then we could do the Z scores and whatnot. But let's add the data and change the X, taking these X's, taking these, control shift down, control backspace. I'm gonna click here and then back on it until I see it populate and then boom, and there we have it. And so let's select this information, control shift down. I'm gonna go to the home tab, font group, make this blue and bordered. All right, and then we could add the Z-score and so on and so forth. But the idea here being is, is we, can, we can make this approximation from the sample, which we'll do multiple times in the future. What we wanna be comfortable uh, with is the, is the idea that we can be, how certain can we be about the mean of the population, the central point, and how certain can we be about the proper standard deviation to use and we get an intuitive feel about these formulas that we're gonna be putting in place to calculate that standard deviation based on whether or not we know the standard deviation of the actual population or don't know the standard deviation of the actual population.